as the nation celebrates Hispanic Heritage Month. We're celebrating Colorado's Hispanic heritage and Hispanics' deep roots in the Centennial State. The sights, the sounds, the movers, the makers, the food, and founders. This is Hispanic Heritage Colorado. Over the next 30 minutes, we're celebrating contributions local Latinos and their families have made to our state, from the foundation to the culture alive and well across colorful Colorado. Art in the Latino community comes in many forms and fashions. And one man is on a mission to save what he describes as a dying art. And there's no doubt you've probably seen it on display, perhaps at a stop sign, maybe right next to you. Here's Vicente Arenas. Tucked away in a backyard garage in Adams County, artist Sonny Valdez is silently trying to save a dying tradition. This is going to be a lost art. It's eventually going to fade away. Meticulous strokes, dazzling colors, whispers of reassurance along the way. I never really considered myself an artist until one day. I just, so many people telling me that, I guess it, it finally stuck and I realized and that's when I decided maybe I should evolve this and see where else I can go with it. Sonny's canvas is a 1969 Chevrolet Impala, a classic being transformed into a lowrider named Silent Whispers, the final act. It's just a passion. It's just a passion that's just evolved over time. You know, I never knew it was gonna take me where it did. I'm glad I got into it when I did. Looking back, it was, it was a tough road. Tough because of a stigma that can come with what many in the Latino community consider a sacred form of art an art at risk of being lost, says Sonny. I hope people would, would get over the stereotype of the drug dealers and the gang members, you know, because that tends to be something that always uh, carries with TV and movies. They tend to put the two together. And in real life, that's not, that's far from the truth. Silent Whispers is owned by Sam Henry. He's paying thousands to restore his passion on wheels. It's his hobby, his sport, his love. You know, it's like if somebody's sitting in a rocking chair at home and watching TV, they're relaxed and they're, and they're enjoying their moment. Henry's been low riding for 42 years. There's a lot of positive things with low riding. It's really family oriented. He has no plans on stopping anytime soon. It's a tradition that I'll keep handing on down to whoever wants to uh, embrace it and learn about it and enjoy it. If Silent Whispers is to be Sam's final act, Sonny's making sure it'll be one to remember. Sonny, why is this so important to you? Well, because if we don't preserve it now, who's gonna, um, you know, it, it's gonna be a lost art eventually and there's not a lot of people doing it. Lowriders in Denver first came onto the scene in the late 60s. Parts of forklifts were used in the first models to mechanize their show-stopping stunts. Sonny's been a fan ever since. A teacher now, awaiting an apprentice. We grow older, us old school guys. You know, we're, we're really the only ones that are left to pass on our knowledge and wisdom and our love for the sport to our kids so they can pass it on to their kids. Traditions come in every form imaginable, even in silent whispers. This is my vision. This is what goes on inside of my head. What I see, what I feel, what I love. You know, it's just a passion. It runs through my blood, it runs through my veins. Sonny is like so many other Hispanics, passing art forms from generation to generation, but there has to be a first. Eric Trujillo followed his artistic path, taking on an unexpected journey. Photojournalist Chris Mosier and Isaiah Medina showing us the way. <laughs> My original music training, I actually went to school to be a jazz saxophone player and I went to college as a jazz student. Through the gift of music, through playing the saxophone, 
Believe it or not, dropping my saxophone was the reason I'm making violins now. I dropped my saxophone and brought it into the music shop that I would eventually go work for and become a violin apprentice in. I left Kalasny Music and with my wife we opened up our family shop. My name is Eric Trujillo and I'm a first generation luthier or violin maker and restorer. A uh, luthier technically is uh, somebody who makes string instruments, violins, cellos, double bass, guitars, ukuleles. My specific specialty is violins, cellos, and bass and ukuleles. In the United States, I only know of three other uh, Latinos that do high-end luthery work. I think there's something honorable in, in doing it by hand. Sometimes it takes a little longer, but it was made by my hands only. My, my family, my wife is a concert violinist, and my kids all play musical instruments. <laughs> I, uh, it's funny, it's been an ongoing joke with me and my clients, and I take care of world-class instruments and world-class musicians, and I build string instruments for amazing musicians, but I can't play the violin to save my life. Being a Chicano luthier is important to me because I want kids that grew up in the circumstances of the neighborhoods like I did, that they have an opportunity. I just want to be a role model. <laughs> That's all I know. <laughs> it's really important to uh, help carry on some of our traditions and uh, in, in music especially. Hispanic artists are on display across Colorado. These words to share is precious, pure, and fair from Mexican artist Anwar Mod are on display on at least 100 buildings across Denver. The quote is from Marvin Gaye's, I want you. In another part of Denver, there's a new effort to restore a fence with hope. So this fence, as you can see, there's, there's a mural on it. If you drove through this Westwood neighborhood in Southwest Denver, you might not even notice it, unless you're a bad guy marking territory. The mural's getting tagged, so we're gonna be fixing it and putting another mural up over it. Time is ticking, though, to figure out what to do with the fence that takes beatings from strangers. Santi Jaramil, an artist from the neighborhood, said it stood here for seven years as a makeshift sanctuary, but then gangs began tagging it. We don't know what the tags are exactly. Then the unthinkable. Someone stole pieces of the fence. <laughs> Determined to not let this piece of art crumble, he and a group of others got to work. How you doing, bro? Dedication and resilience from volunteers like Zion Jaramil, who's from Westwood. When it was first up here, there was no tagging. It was nice, like me and my buddies will talk about it, but now it's like there's so much tagging on it, it's ridiculous. A park will go here someday. I think there's just a lot of frustration. You know, the violence is, has spiked here. I think I wanted to start off with. What was becoming an eyesore yeah. is now getting a facelift. Right there. So what we're gonna be putting up is a, is a giant uh, photograph mural. It could overlap, you know. It's gonna be photos from people around the neighborhood some of the community leaders, some of the kids who live here in the projects. Pictures of people like Paul Gonzalez, who's turned his life around and is now inspiring others here. What we're trying to do is just give, give the community a face. There are no fancy museums in this part of Denver, but there are beyond talented artists with big hearts who care. Well, we're hoping that um, what we can do is elevate the neighborhood. This fence has now become a symbol a fence of hope. Covering up graffiti and combating any gang violence and things of that nature, I'm all for it. The idea though is to get it, to stop it before it gets bad. We wanted to sort of beautify everything, try to bring a positive message again. That message could take time, but worth it, they say. I think visibly having people out here and showing that people care and are wanting to improve the community, this is one piece of that. It's one more step, <laughs> Right on. a homegrown look Perfect. To help a struggling neighborhood yeah, got it. have a better tomorrow. A local brewing company partnering with the Denver County Clerk's Office to encourage others to vote this November with an American-style cream ale called Vota, meaning vote in Spanish. Raices Brewing Company also doing ballots and beer events where customers can come with questions about voting while enjoying a cold one. Raices is one of the first Hispanic breweries in Colorado offering beer with a side of culture. <laughs> When you have a beer at Raices, it should feel like an experience. The most important thing is to provide this place that is more than just a bar. <laughs> and it may be 
Because the love its creators have for a carefully crafted cerveza. I love it. Uh, it's my passion. Is matched by the love they have for where they came from. This is our culture. This is our roots. We're proud of this. Raiz says translates to roots in Spanish. Jose Bateta recently planted his roots in Denver, Colorado, after living on the East Coast for decades. But Jose was raised in Costa Rica. His family immigrated to the U.S. when he was 13 years old without immigration papers in hopes of a better life. The necessity sometimes is bigger than the permission that you need to be able to move. Jose recalls one of his family's first nights in the U.S. He says it's similar to scenes still playing out today. Spending a night in the same jail cell overnight, terrified, not knowing what was going to happen. But Jose says his family persevered. He eventually became the first person in his family to graduate from college, and he recently became a U.S. permanent resident and is now part owner to one of Denver's first Hispanic owned breweries and running a $3 million project is pretty amazing. Raices came together as Jose dreamed of a new business opportunity. He found an intriguing gap in his research. Out of over 8,000 plus breweries in the U.S., less than half of a percent of them are owned by Latinos, yet consumption is closer to 18 percent. For Jose and his partners, breaking into the competitive craft brewery business was only part of the goal. The beer almost becomes the vehicle for us to be able to accomplish the other things that have to do with culture. Every pour. We have bilingual beer servers. I think we're going to get ready to talk about cerveza soon. Okay? To the ingredients. Our manguito beer. It's a 4.5% uh, summer ale. To the music. <laughs> to the art. It's a celebration of who we are. Every aspect of Raices is infused with Latino culture. Jose hopes that it taps into the next generation of business owners and change makers. If we're able to impact young people and say, hey, be proud of where you came from, be proud of the color of your skin and how you talk and what you look like, if we accomplish that at the end of the day, you feel better about yourself internally and you make bigger goals for yourself. And that's exactly what we want. Raices is pretty rare. Hispanic Coloradans make up just 7% of businesses in our state, even though the population size is at 21%. And in Southern Colorado, that number is much higher, as high as 62%. And that's where we find Greg Nieto. <music> If you've ever debated the best chili to buy. This is a big meeting place for people. Everyone is family here. Isaiah Gallegos and Angel Chavez are here to save you some time. We can talk and make connections all over Chile. In the Austin Bluffs section of Colorado Springs, it's another busy day at the V Hill Farms stand where they say, it's because of the heat and it's because of the flavor. Roasting is really living. The two Hispanic millennials standing behind their product. The boss made us earn our stripes for sure. Many ways they have sprouted up alongside of it. They've made a pretty big name for themselves, um, especially here in the Springs. We have a pretty big thumbprint here on the edge of Austin Bluffs, mostly because of how much work the big guy has put in. Uh, Praxi Vijo, he's been running this farm. Uh, my name is Praxi Vijo. We've been in the business for over 90-some years, I'm the third generation farmer. The big guy is Presidio, or Proxy Vigil. Proxy, a big guy. Me and my dad, yeah, the only Hispanic farmers here in Pueblo. Behind a larger-than-life guy. Kind of a pride and joy is farming. His dad, Proxy Sr., who stops by after tending to his farm, one piece of land over. Well, about five, six different varieties. Seven different varieties. Seven different varieties. Of Green chilies. chilies. Both Hills say the Hill legacy began with their parents. Mom always in charge. And she was a very special mom. His grandma, my mom, she's the one that instilled all of this to us, you know. Proxy Senior, one of 15 siblings who made a promise to their mother to not only graduate from high school, but make a difference in the world. For generations, father and son have made their case as to why Pueblo Vigil Chili is head and shoulders above the popular Hatch Chili from the 505 area code to the south. I don't know if it's in the ground or you know what it is, but uh, you know we don't use any herbicides or nothing. We just, Mother Nature takes care of us. Vigil Chili takes care of the rest. I'm kind of getting up in age now where, you know, these young, the younger generations are taking over stuff. My boy. Which 
brings Isaiah Gallegos and Angel Chavez back to the table. I've had people come and switch from Hatch to Green Chili to our Pueblo Chili all the time. Who remain loyal to the chili that raised them. Taste buds never lie. And everyone knows that when summer's gone and you smell chili, that's a Pueblo, Colorado thing. Much more to come as we celebrate Colorado's Hispanic heritage. Barriers broken right here in Colorado. We have to be a part of government. We have to be a part of institutions if we want to bring change. We are just getting started on Hispanic heritage, Colorado. Right now, there are a record number of Hispanics serving in the state capitol, 15 of them. Now, the list of Hispanic leaders is much longer. Susana Cordova is the first Hispanic superintendent for Denver Public Schools. Federico Pena was Denver's first Hispanic mayor. Linda Alvarado is the first Hispanic owner of a major league baseball team. Success is a common thread in each of their stories. So are the struggles they faced. We spoke with Susana Cordova inside the Denver school she taught in in 1989. The Denver native found as a teacher she could help others overcome some of the same challenges she faced as a DPS student. I had countless teachers tell me education is the key to getting out of your neighborhood and like why did I want to get out of my neighborhood? I, I, I really decided to become a teacher because I wanted to invest in my neighborhood. She started as a bilingual teacher and worked her way up to the central office and in 2019 became the superintendent. Along the way, she struggled with confidence, scanning a room as she walked in looking for others who looked like her. For a long time, I just didn't feel like I fit in. I didn't feel like I fit the profile of um, you know what a superintendent looks like. Today she still hopes to accomplish what she set out to do 31 years ago. Perhaps the biggest surprise in this year's race for mayor is 36 year old Federico Pena. Federico Pena is from Laredo, Texas. The town was founded by his fifth great grandfather more than 250 years ago. But there are millions of other Latino families around the United States who have been contributing for centuries. We spoke with Pena at Denver International Airport. As Denver's mayor, he spearheaded the development of DIA. When Pena ran for office back in 1983, not everyone saw him as the right leader. He recalled a conversation with a friend before the election. And he said, you know, Federico, I don't think Denver's ready for a Hispanic mayor. And he was being very honest. And even after he won. Some people did not like the fact that I'd become mayor of Denver. When I took the oath on the steps of the city and county building, there were threats against my life. So the police department made me wear a bulletproof vest. After serving as mayor for eight years, he went on to become the first Latino to head two federal agencies, the Department of Transportation and Department of Energy under President Bill Clinton. Today, he is a successful businessman. When you give people like me an opportunity, we will produce. In fact, we may even surprise people. The Colorado Rockies are the National League wild card winners. Linda Alvarado met us at Coors Field. In the 90s, she was part of the ownership group that helped bring Major League Baseball to Denver. Who would have thought the first Latino owner would be a Latina? Before becoming part owner of the Colorado Rockies, she started her career with a development company in college, and eventually she started her own Alvarado Construction. Early on, she realized to grow her business, she needed a loan. Access to capital was very difficult for women, but Hispanic women? After she was turned down by six banks, her parents borrowed $2,500 and surprised her with the money. So their belief in me motivated me that I could succeed. Today, her company has offices in four states with a portfolio that includes high profile projects like Mile High Stadium. She hopes her story is one that inspires anyone of any race or gender to succeed. More than that, opening the doors for other people to do that. The ongoing coronavirus pandemic hitting the Hispanic community harder than most. Some traditions on hold, others taking on a new look, refusing to be silenced amid the sickness. Much more to come on Hispanic Heritage Colorado. Like so many traditions, the COVID-19 pandemic paused performances for Denver's first and only all-female mariachi group. The group practices in the backyard serenading the neighborhood, but performing is just part of the tradition. Every celebration that we have in our culture always has music, and mariachi music is one of the most popular, whether it's fiestas, whether it's quinceañeras, whether it's baptisms, birthdays, even funerals. 
The pandemic is hitting Hispanic families in Colorado especially hard. Hundreds of Latino families have lost loved ones. Nearly 37% of COVID-19 cases in Colorado come from the Hispanic community, even though our community only makes up 22% of the population. The pandemic pausing performances and parties. Deanna Cruz's baby girl is about to reach a memorable milestone. Abigail turns 15 this year, and for many Latinos, the event is marked with an elaborate party. A quinceanera is a coming of age celebration. From a you know a little girl into a young lady. Planning for a traditional quinceanera event takes months, from the cake to the decorations to the venue to the dress. The dress is like. 75% of the whole thing. 14 couples that join the quinceanera on the dance floor for choreographed ballroom dancing. You know, they do a traditional vals dance. Deanna was extra excited for her girls' night. She never had a quinceanera of her own. As one of four girls in her family, her parents couldn't afford the costly tradition. Her being my only daughter, so I was like even thinking of I can live my quinceanera through her. But it turns out Abigail may not have one either. Like so many Planned special moments in 2020, COVID-19 forced the Cruz family to cancel. Basically, it broke my heart to have to tell her. The sudden change in plans, though, is creating an opportunity for a new experience and perhaps the start of a new tradition. Abigail may still have a quinceanera if circumstances permit, but if they don't. She suggested <laughs> maybe a, a trip to Paris, mom and daughter. I'm OK with that. Hispanic versus Latino, Latina versus Latinx. We're sorting out what the Hispanic community prefers as Hispanic Heritage Colorado rolls on. I am going to make Vida the spot for Latinx culture. Pop culture is helping popularize a new term in the Hispanic community. Instead of Latino or Latina, Latinx is used as a gender neutral term. Still, Pew Research finding just one in four Latino adults have heard of Latinx and just 3% use it. The comparison I'd make is if you ask someone who's Italian where they're from, they're going to say Italy, not Europe. And if I am yeah, from Latin America, by definition, I'm Latino. But if somebody asks me, I'm going to say I'm Mexican. No matter what you call yourself, be proud. You are part of a Hispanic community that runs deep in Colorado. After all, our state is not named the color red in English. Thank you for joining us.